this episode of Rocket Chain Anywhere, we will be discussing slash spoiling the 2018 remake of A Wrinkle in Time from Disney. Listen he at your will own be risk. spoiling it, and he will be discussing it. Well, obviously, it, it has a happy ending. Huh. Have you ever really gotten to know the microwave? Like, everything it can do, all of its powers. I know that it has the power to be silent whenever it's like 12 midnight and you want to cook yourself a Hot Pocket. Well, it's not like... The beeps can be silent, but like it's not going to be... Not going... No, the beeps will be silent. You can silent it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, have you ever looked at like all the powers? Like, if you push like the right combination of buttons, you can perfectly cook like a slice of pizza. Yes, I know how to do that. Because I showed you that, but like. No, because I've read it. Well, months. I'm asking all the chips out there. Just drop what they're doing right now. Spend some time with their microwave, because I'm pretty sure it can do more than what you use it for right now. It's part of the family. I know. I mean, those things last for so long. <laughs> I knew a guy, he kept using his microwave even after the screen broke because he knew it so well he could operate it without the screen. Welcome to Rocket to Anywhere, the show whose host's hearts are beating to the beat. Of it. <laughs> no. I'm Corban. I'm Sophia. And Garcia. Sophia is eating Doritos over there. So. Uh, no, I got braces. <laughs> oh yes, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, that's why I'm fucking weird. <laughs> yes. This week we're gonna be doing a shorter episode just to give out our thoughts on the 2018 version of A Wrinkle in Time. If you didn't hear the spoiler alert at the beginning, we'll also be learning a new word and tell a couple of space-related jokes. Who? Not me. Yes, someone didn't prepare properly. Someone actually sticks up to the name of the podcast. Speaking of sticking up to things, only piece of follow-up this week is that it has been 20 episodes since I said that we were going to talk about Paddington 2. That movie came out in November. It is completely my fault, so sorry, folks. No review of that coming because I thought it came out in January. Well, now into thought of the week. What do you have, Sophia? Oh, it's that time. You know how whenever you're eating something, it'll, like, fall apart or whatever? Mm-hmm. And, like, you wish you could, like, put tape on it so it could stay together? <laughs> yes. Okay, so someone should invent edible tape put on, like, your burritos and tacos and burgers and stuff. Well, glue is already edible. That's true, but it doesn't work. Yeah. I remember when we were younger, like, we would go that, places and we would, like, get a cookie, right? And we would break it up into, like, a million tiny pieces. Oh, yeah. And we would just eat little pieces and be like, oh, it lasts longer. It's so much bigger now. Oh, I thought you were going to say that we would break it up and then push it back together and it would somehow stay together. Well, okay, there are those weird cookies that have the ability to do that and you just should not be digesting those. Speaking of things we did back in the early 2000s, one of those things was watching Dora a lot and Diego. And I was recently thinking about Dora and realized that Dora considers herself an explorer. But she only explores, in air quotes, only explores mapped places. That's why I say glow, 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 not glow. Go exploring, (laughs) not touring. Yep, episode 40 of the podcast, which hopefully you listened to before spring break last week. Yep. Now to learn a word. I suspect you don't have a word this week. Of course. Of course, okay. So my word this week is schnook. Schnook. S. C-H-N-O-O-K. It means someone easily tricked. Huh, that's you. Me? Yeah. You, you have your braces back in. Yes. <laughs> they're, they're, um, what are they called? Detachable. A.K.A. a toothpick. Schnook is a synonym to gullible. It's, it's like that Arthur episode where D.W. thinks being gullible is a good thing, and she's like, but I want to be gullible. Now into joke time. Imagine how terrified the first person who ever saw a whale was. <laughs> Wrote Moby Dick. That's what happened. Probably. What do you call a dog with no legs? I don't know. Anything you want. It's still not going to come. <laughs> Sorry, Peta. Peta. Okay. So I already told Corban this, but it's still funny. So. If you <laughs> like, say... wait, when you tell me a joke and immediately it just becomes not funny. Yeah, usually. If you say flea really fast, it sounds like you're saying leaf. Is that ready? 
Flee, 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 flee. See? Felice Navidad. <laughs> no, Felice Navidad. Ah, yes, it's poetry. Put a period after it. If you spent your day in a well, can you say your day was well spent? No, because what money did, what money did you spend in the well? It depends on what amount of money you spent. Yep. Well. How uh, much money did you throw in the well before you fell in it? I, I put a coupon in there. Oh, uh, well, that was not well spent. <laughs> I had a coupon. One free wish. Not a dream. People that work on a farm and take care of chickens should be called chicken tenders. <laughs> I told you this the other day and you were like, that's not funny. Well, I didn't hear it. Why did Mickey Mouse go into outer space? I don't know. He was looking for Pluto. Wow. And then Pluto called and said, please get all this junk off my planet. Throw back to the Magic School Bus episode. This little boy next door just opened his window and yelled, What is 32 plus 7? So I yelled back, It's 39. And he said, Thank you so much. I've been wondering all day. You know, that that is a way to do your math homework. Just yell it out and into the wild and see if anyone calls back with the answer. I mean, if you have, like, neighbors that don't speak the same language, don't even bother, so. How does one astronaut on the moon tell another astronaut that he's sorry, other than sign language? He goes back to Earth? (laughs) Just to say sorry. Singing that song. Is it too late now to say sorry? No. He apologizes. All right. Well, that's it for joke time. So instead of doing Today I Learned This Week, which is a segment I sort of killed off anyway, I'm going to be bringing a segment onto this show, which I used to have on my old show called cool stuff I found. I forgot to tell Sophia about this before recording today, so I don't think she has anything, unless you can come up with something right now. But... For what? Cool stuff I found. Something cool you found on the internet. I found Rubik's Cubes. Cubes. Seeing Oprah in A Wrinkle in Time, which we're talking about this week, reminded me of the following website I'm about to send Sophia to. So, open Safari on your phone, which I believe Uh you have. Uh Type in the website bees, B-E-E-S, Bees, bees, bees dot com. Three bees. Now we're just gonna record Sophia's reaction, okay. but don't just don't explain what's gonna happen. Don't explain it. Just give your reaction. Everyone, spend some time. Go check this website. There's a link in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it before. Uh oh. I was hoping you hadn't seen it before. Wow, did you think I was that white? Well, hopefully you guys enjoy this as much as I did. I'm all of those people combined. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, now on to our topic this week, which is the 2018 version, or the recent remake, of A Wrinkle in Time. If you haven't heard of A Wrinkle in Time before, here is the logline, or... More of the synopsis, not a long line. After the disappearance of her scientist father, three peculiar beings send Meg, her brother, and her friend to space in order to find him. It's a adaptation of the classic 1960s book by Madeline LeIngle. Now, here's my disclaimer. Neither Sophia or I have read the book, which is shocking for me, not reading a book before watching a movie. So, I think... We are going to bring a different perspective to this review because we're only going to be comparing it to the 2003 movie. Mm -hmm. So let's get started. I just wanted to say uh, at the beginning of the movie, there was all these trailers running and there was a, um, a, a trailer for a movie called, you know, The Grinch from Illumination. Oh, yeah. Okay. First of all, I think that's the only like if I actually watch that movie, I think that's the only Grinch movie I'll actually like. I don't know. Well, I do things to say. One, the minion at the beginning. I I literally facepalm. Like, come on, you don't you don't have to put the minions in front of every movie from your entertainment company. Also, they played that song "Happy" as his alarm, which is from Despicable Me, and then they named his dog Max. Okay, this is the production okay. company that made Sing, or uh, that made Secret Life of Pets with no, the dog named Max. But in the books, his name is Max. Well, I feel like people who are going who haven't read the books should be like, 
wasn't the dog from Secret Life of Pets and Max, and this is from the same okay, company. Who would remember that but you? Mm, okay, okay. Anyway, also in the trailer is Mary Poppins. I'm so excited. Ew. Yeah, it has it has Lin Manuel Miranda in it so far. So yeah. that makes it worse. Okay, and there's Ready Player One. Looks exciting. Ooh, that one's better. Mm, okay. So. Well, at the opening of the movie, we had the big Disney logo. I'm over here with my conductor's hands in the air, just going la da da da. And then at the end, when it shakes with all like like the 3D animation at the end, I was like, I'm ready. It's it's like a Trap Nation song is about to start. You know how it shakes like that and all the colors go. I was like, mm. oh, we're about to start an EDM. In this opening scene, there was absolutely okay. So the opening scene, we have Meg and and her dad in like the laboratory, the home laboratory on the side. Tell me, were they not mumbling so much? Okay, they were at some at some t- t- certain times, but not all the time. Okay, for me, they were mumbling like absolutely so much. I didn't understand maybe like the first minute of what he said. It's like and whatever. We only have a big time. I think it's more combined that it, they were speaking in very hushed tones, but I, I, I would have liked some captions. Something I noticed about the entire movie in general, I want to get out of the way, is that there was a lot of ADR, a lot of like ADR's uh, additional dialogue replacement where they record the video and audio separately. So like they'll record the video and then the actors will come back into the studio and record their lines over their mouth moving. So it, it just does not look right. So this movie started off um, after the before after the flashback. We went to basically setting up the world, the, the whole hero's journey, you know, setting up the normal world, what it's like, and we get to see Meg and, and what's been going on with her having to deal with the loss of, of her father or more of like his, his missing. And here's where it, it strayed differently from the 2003 movie. We got to see what her life was like, you know, having to go to school and having to be picked on by all these kids, especially on the day we join it, which is like the four year anniversary of him going missing. And um, okay, who in their world would make that an anniversary? Like, I, I know that's because the thing is, he wasn't even much of a respected scientist. Yeah, people thought he was crazy. So why would you? celebrate it or remember it yeah now um i I didn't know how to really feel about the whole world setting thing where they you know they set it up in the school i I feel like they should have used the home to more to explain like the current state of the family and what's been going on with them since the missing of of the father but well at school it did but but yeah but it did get put across yes it did yeah, so I'm saying it, you were still. It, I don't know. I think now that I think about it more, I think they actually it was a good idea to have that whole school thing at the beginning. And and speaking of the school, um, Sophia and I recently watched a video from like the Washington Post explaining why kids don't use lockers anymore. So when I saw them using the lockers, I was like, uh, I don't know, right? "Lockers aren't cool anymore." We get introduced slowly to all the different characters: the Mrs. Watson, the Who, and and all of them. But I feel like the the writer has, like, trouble figuring out how to introduce characters. Because when we get introduced to Calvin, or as I like to call him, Keith, because Calvin O'Keefe, um, it's like, oh, I just felt like I needed to be here. I'm like, that's terrible introduction. Like, oh, hi, Meg, I'm just walking down the street because I had a feeling that I needed to be here. Mm-hmm. But speaking of Calvin, I, I think his casting was okay or, or better than last time. Because last time he was like this 90s school kid. It was like, yeah, I'm so cool. Yeah. Here he's like, yeah, I'm just a normal kid. Also, uh, Miss Who over there, she has like narcolepsy. She just keeps falling asleep. So uh, Mysterious Benedict Society stuff there. So as we get introduced to all the characters, um, they get sent over. Uh, eventually, when we cross into Act 2, they get sent over to the other land. Or what do they call it? What's that? What's that world called? What do they call it? Uh, did it have a name? I don't know. I, I like to call it the Dr. Seuss world because it looks like a Dr. Seuss book. <laughs> True. And uh, I was I leaned over to tell Sophia, I don't know if she heard me, but I said it was a literal crossing of the threshold from uh, the hero's journey. I didn't hear you. When they uh, crossed over, though, I did say it looks like the time vortex, like the death out of Dr. Who. Someone. Some, someone with visual effects watched Dr. Who. 
Speaking of visual effects in, in the credits, there were 10 visual effects production houses hired to do the visual effects for this movie. 10 houses. That is a lot. Also, um, <laughs> once we get into this uh, Dr. Seuss world, we start to see all the, the three people who are like the main characters there. And did it not look like they were just wearing costumes made out of foil paper? Well, that one costume. Yeah, yes. Oprah's costume. Just like, oh, I'm wearing foil paper. Just like, oh, your costumes. Or what's what, just your outfits are so beautiful. I'm like, yeah, foil paper, so beautiful. When they start getting set up, and they start talking about the world, and they explain what it is, and then the character, uh, Oprah's character, starts going into like what its powers and what its influences on the world. Uh, it is the character, so don't get confused. I'll probably emphasize that it and it or it is a difference. Um, I feel like they could have used better examples other than like a guy getting his groceries knocked out of his hand and the kid getting yelled at. Hmm. But later when I'm talking to someone else about this, they said, but I, he was telling me, you know what? It's more like people in their mind have their own vision of what it, if it was real, what it did to them. So we didn't really need to see it because people know what happens. Yeah. But we get to this point. And I was like, oh, wow, it hasn't been long. How long did it take to get to this Dr. Seuss world? Sophia, guess, how long did it take for them to get from Earth to this, this world? How long do you think it took them? It took like an hour. It took one hour, yeah. One hour. So the running time is, is one hour and nine minutes. So it took one hour out of the hour and, and 40 minutes or so to get to this Dr. Seuss world. And from there, things just started going so fast-paced. I feel like they, they never actually spent some time to actually think about or, or process what's going on in the world. Like, I feel like they spent too much time in this, like, that seer place or whatever it was, that guy there. I was like, wait, what is this? this what What okay. is his point? I felt that it wasn't right that the person who played that guy also played their dad. That wasn't fair. He did? Yes. Did I you didn't see know. it? No, I don't think so. Yes, he did. It was in the credits. Oh. I didn't even see that. Well, I, I like this line at the end when he's like, when Meg's like, you sound like my mom. He's like, oh, is she baritone? Yeah. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> no one laughed except us. Like, there were some guys behind us, like, they're just laughing at everything that's not even funny. And then we laugh at the actual funny stuff. And they're like, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is at this point. This is where I call Act Two Point Five because I couldn't really tell if Act Two begins where they cross into this Doctor Seuss world, as I call it, or if it begins when they actually go into Camazot's or or its planet, because technically, according to the hero's journey, it's when the hero, which is in this case Meg, decides. To, because the whole time they've been denying the call, denying the call, and then at the point when they say, you know, they accept it, they need to do this, something about it, that's the beginning of Act 2, the crossing of the threshold. So technically, it took an hour and 20 minutes or so to get to the point of crossing of the threshold. From here on, we, we speed through Camazots, the whole land. We get through all the different trials and tests that it puts for them. You know, you have the, the iconic basketball scene, bouncing on the basketballs. You have an added beach scene. You have this forest they added, all this stuff. To get into it, then um, Charles gets taken by it and, you know, transformed or gets taken over. Then uh, they get taken into the Central Central or what did he call it? They emphasized it more in the other movie. Yeah. But this one, it was just like a place. <laughs> the place. Sounds like a new youth group. It's like, come to the place. So uh, they, they end up in the central station that basically looks like the inside of a home pod of an Apple home pod. It's like, yeah, it's just, it's just this, these holes. It looks like a speaker. She uses the, the glasses given to her by one of the characters. I, I always get their names mixed up. It's like that joke that you told at a talent show. And it's like, what did the who say to the what when the why wasn't there? Whatever it was. What? Yeah, yeah we, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. What? That's right. This is where things started going downhill for me. It's like I didn't feel like it was powerful enough or actually fighting enough against them. It was like, oh, I'm just going to push you back again. You stand up. I'm going to push you back down. Literally push you back down with my, my powers. And I, I don't think we should have lost the man in the suit who fell apart. Like 
the mannequin thing, he should have stayed there alongside Charles. Hmm. So uh, she uses the glasses. She's able to see some invisible thing climb up into this, uh, like, basically prison. <laughs> it doesn't look like a prison. It looks like a Drake set for a song, like he's recording. <laughs> it's basically this orange and maroon room. Dad's in there. They meet again. And um, they get back together. And then for some reason, they the dad sends himself back. I, I didn't get this point. Could you explain what happened there? Because I-, I was looking down writing my notes. It got to him. It did? It it did? <laughs> yes. So it sent him back and left Meg? No, it got to him and told him that it was more important to take only one of his kids and not even try to get the other one. Yeah, but the thing is, Meg stayed. So what happened? Why did the dad go back and, and Meg stay? Remember the first time that all of the, the misses wanted to teleport? And they left her because of her will to not go made them. Oh, not okay, go. okay. So it's that same thing where basically he was trying to, yeah, tesseract her, but she stayed because she wanted to save Charles. Yeah. Okay, so it happened. I guess the twice, second time it happened. I guess this is where we would go into the restaurant scene, which I feel is very iconic from the two thousand three movie, or was it a roller skating rink or whatever it was? I don't remember. But what? You know, there was in the 2003 movie, uh, Charles and It go into this like restaurant or something and they're fighting against Meg. I don't remember that. Well, basically, that happened here in this movie. But I have to say, it was better because it was like it went inside It's brain or wherever like the raw oh, power yeah. stored. And I feel like that was, uh, you could take it more seriously. You could feel more attached to the characters than to be in some little, you know, little restaurant or whatever it was. It it basically helped you feel feel more attached to them because they were they were in a more dire situation, not just sitting in, in, in some place that feels normal. Okay, so then we cross over in to Act Three after Meg, you know, it says the whole line, uh, Charles, we love you, whatever, whatever and it, it breaks loose out of him. And um basically I wanna know, what was your opinion? What happened to it? Did it get defeated? Did it go dormant or like hibernate or is it still there, and and she only got rid of it for her personal purposes? It's still there. It's just saying that you can overcome it, but you have to overcome it, like, every single time. So everyone has to personally overcome it? Yes. Every single time. So, like, just because she overcame it this time doesn't mean it's not going to come back, like, you know, tomorrow or whatever. So you're saying Meg can't eradicate, get rid of it by herself for everyone. Can't just get rid of it completely. No, it's a personal thing. Oh. Everybody has it, but you have to have your battle with it every single day. So that's why they... You're just not face-to-face with it. So that's why they did, like, the Spy Kids 4 thing or the Tomorrowland thing basically creating like an army or a group of warriors who are going to fight against it and like that's how the movie ends yeah is that so that's what they were doing like you're our next warrior or whatever yeah no but basically you're our next person who needs to find out that they can overcome it huh. i guess it makes sense yeah think well the travel home act three comes the travel home and the while they're coming home like she jumps in the tesseract thing it's like all these like ribbons floating around and it's all red and yellowish. I'm like, this looks like the thirteenth doctor's time vortex. When we when we get to the end, I was like, wait, is this the fake house thing? Because remember there was like a fake house when she got back. She was like, I'm back, I'm back, and she comes in. It's a fake house, fake everybody from the 2003 movie. Oh yeah. I was like, I thought that's what was happening. I was like, wait, this is all fake. This is all fake. And the movie ended. I was like, wait, oh, so that didn't happen. I was like, I was leaning over Sophia, like, this isn't real. This isn't real. Trust me, it's not real. So um, I, I was thinking about when did the movie take place? Uh, and I think this movie takes place in 2020. No. Well, why? Because they would have had, you know, more technology. Yeah, but the dad in the flashback scene, he has an ultra-wide display. And ultra-wide displays weren't invented until 2016. And he went missing four years from then. So that's 2020. You know what? Nobody cares about that, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, my my thing, I think, is like, I'd keep an eye on Charles, okay? Just be careful. Yeah. It might come back into him. 
So uh, end of the movie comes, the end end, and I, I it's this is where I was like I was clapping to myself. I was like yes yes. We ended in the same shot that we started with in the beginning. It was not the same. It just looked the same. Well, well, yeah, but it looked it looked the same. It was like the 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 sun peeking through the clouds, flying over. It was really nice. So it's like the same thing they did in Iron Man three. I watched some video essay from some uh, commentator like. Movies need to start to end with the same shots, but they need to be lighter in the end and darker in the beginning to show the light is overcome. Hmm. Okay. So, that's the end. Get to the credits. Saw a bunch of new names that, uh, you know, new names, new people in the industry. Always nice to see that. And uh, overall, what do you think of the movie? How many many basketball bounces out of 10 would you give this? For this movie, 8, because it could be better. Mm-hmm. I personally rate this movie somewhere around a five mm. because it looked great, cinematography amazing, everything amazing, score is amazing. But the one thing that drives the movie, the story, I feel the story was very, very mediocre. Mm-hmm. It 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 started strong, and. When Act Two hit, it just it's just like slumping. It's so weak. Now compared to the two thousand three version, what do you think? The old one, but it would have to be remade because it's like bad, it's worse quality. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, visual effects are pretty bad. Same here. I'd I'd pick the two thousand three version because I feel the story was explained stronger because you know you had the original writer of the book on set because uh, she was alive then. Now she died in 2007 wasn't able to work on this one but i feel like the 2003 version was better because she was actually there to help the writers so that's our uh, review of the 2018 version of a wrinkle in time so now let's move on to our recommendations of the week would you recommend this movie as your recommendation of the week yes i would also recommend the other one yeah check your local library i'm pretty sure they have a copy of it wait Watch the older one first. Yeah, yeah. Cause that way you won't be lost whenever you watch the new one. Yeah, because like, if you're coming brand new into the to the new one, I think you would be very lost on the story. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get it. Yeah. So my recommendation of the week is a book called When You Reach Me by Rebecca Steed. It uses the book A Wrinkle in Time as a MacGuffin or as a plot device. Um, I don't want to spoil it for you, but it's a great book to read or a great book to listen to as an audiobook after you watch or read A Wrinkle in Time. Here's the story, uh, the synopsis. Shortly after a fallout with her best friend, sixth grader Miranda starts receiving mysterious notes and she doesn't know what to do. The notes tell her that she must write a letter, a true story, and that she can't share her mission with anyone. It would be easy to ignore the strange messages, except that whoever is leaving them has an uncanny ability to predict the future. If that is the case then Miranda has a big problem because the notes tell her that someone is going to die and she might be too late to stop it so it's a great book piggybacks off a wrinkle in time I don't want to spoil it anymore oh oh is that the one you told me about yeah it's the one I told you about that that was great yeah it's great so thanks for listening this week this is your first time please subscribe on Apple Podcasts Google Play Podcasts Spotify and anywhere else podcasts are available links for all of our locations are available at rta.space slash listen if you have any suggestions for us or you want to send us some jokes or something for us to talk about you can email us rocket to anywhere show at gmail.com or tweet at us at rta show on twitter show notes for this week's episode are available at rta.space slash 48 and you can follow me on twitter at corbon garcia you can follow me on instagram at bailey and rushy rushy is r u s h i e yes rushy we'll be back week after next to discuss books that are movies and books that should be movies Uh, until then you sound like my mom Uh, is she a baritone 